Christian artists can be messy. That's the thing that I wanted to explore. That was the hook that made me want to do the book. It's so simple, but you just you, you just never think of, oh, Christians can be messy too. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting concept. I'm not sure anybody's ever written about that before. And me being the cynical journalist, I wanted to explore that. You are listening to the Christian Music Archive podcast, part of the new release today podcast network. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. Each week, I share stories about Christ, community, and music, chatting with musical guests who you will find listed on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. There are thousands of creative men and women who have helped shape the soundtrack of the Christian faith, and we get to hear their stories, learn about how Christ has made a difference in their life, and hopefully along the way, we'll learn how we can be a better part of our community. About a month ago, my wife and I got to see the Jesus Music movie, which was put out by the Irwin Brothers. This movie chronicles the rise of Christian music from the early Jesus Music movement through the rise of a genre that grew into a burgeoning industry. And if you are relatively new to the faith-inspired music, this movie is going to be a great introduction to where we are today. Now, it really isn't possible to capture 50 years of music into a two-hour film. So for a deeper dive, you need a book. And today, I'm talking with Marshall Terrell, the author of The Jesus Music Book, which is a companion project to the movie. We're going to get a bit of insight into the research process Marshall went through as he researched this book. Before our conversation today, I want to tell you about another exciting Mercy, Inc. program. Starfish Kids is a child sponsorship and development program in the northern part of Haiti. Students in 30 schools are sponsored each month for $25 a month. That money pays for tuition and books so that the students can get a Christian education. And in addition to school, students are also attending church, and a lot of times the entire family will attend too. That $25 a month contribution also helps pay to train and retain teachers. Now, this really surprised me. A well-trained teacher in Haiti makes about 1,800 Haitian good a month. That's about $20 a month in U.S. currency. That's just crazy. Starfish Kids would love to support and train more kids and add additional schools to the ones they're already working with. I'd like to encourage you to sponsor a girl or a boy today through the great work of Starfish Kids. And you can learn more by visiting mercycompassion.org and clicking on the child sponsorship link. That's mercycompassion.org. And thanks for making a difference for a child today. For the first time in the history of this podcast, my guest today is not a musician listed on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. Now, I know you've come to expect great interviews with the musicians you love, but I promise this episode is still worth listening to because today... I'm interviewing Marshall Terrell, who is the author of the brand new book, The Jesus Music, which is a companion to the movie of the same name. Marshall has done a great job chronicling the rise of contemporary music out of the Jesus movement into the industry juggernaut it is today. And as a fan of Christian music, you will definitely want to read this book. So join me in welcoming to the podcast, Marshall Terrell. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. You know, you said history and... uh this is the second time now somebody has pointed out to me that I've made history. Yeah. The first time I did a podcast last week, and they told me, and I didn't know this, but they said I was the first um, K-Love author in their history. And I went, wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So this is interesting. Well, you're a pretty busy author. I mean, because the Jesus Music book is your 26th book. Is that correct? Yes, that's yep. correct. And it was it was the fourth book of, believe it or not, of, of 2021. I, I did, in the span of one year, uh, I did four books. And two of them oh have goodness. yet to be released. So, yeah, I have been busy. But uh, I've been blessed. So you know a thing or two about writing books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, 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 the great thing is, is that I have, uh, I have a great editor. So when we, we, we write, we, we edit at the same time. Uh -huh. So 
the uh, publisher is able to get it quicker, and and and, and they like that. They like they like speed more yeah. than quality. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about some of the other books you've written. You've done some sports stuff. You've done. You've done seven books, I think, about Steve McQueen. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Steve McQueen was my first book. And then um, I didn't think I was going to write about him again. Uh, and that first book was done in 1993. And I just thought, well, I will be done with him by then because I thought he was just going to have his turn in the sun, um, much like Humphrey Bogart did in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But then McQueen's legend just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I kept getting these opportunities to write more books about him. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll go for it. So I've done, uh, uh, and I did three books on Elvis Presley. Okay. And then I did one with a guitarist. I hope you know who this is. His name is Lawrence Juber, and he was the last guitarist for Paul McCartney and Wings. Oh, okay. And he's phenomenal. I mean, he is, in my opinion, the greatest guitarist in the world. Mm. I know I'm going to get some uh, flack for that. But <laughs> he's, he's truly amazing. If you if you have a chance, uh, uh, pick up one of his um he does he does these ode to the Beatles and oh, but okay. he plays like he plays the 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 melody and the chorus all together in one on the acoustic guitar. Oh wow. And it's the most amazing sound you've ever heard. We did a book called Guitar with Wings. So uh, you know what I try to do is I stay within the pop culture realm. I like mm -hmm. to do uh music, film, TV, um anything that is 20, 20th century, preferably 60s, <laughs> 70s. That's, you know, that's my wheelhouse. Sure. Well, what was it about Steve McQueen that drew you to him to write seven books about Steve McQueen? Well, he was uh, my hero growing up. You know, he was my dad's hero too. So uh -huh. growing up, we'd watch his movies together. It was kind of a bonding experience. And then, you know, on screen, he appeared to be this all-American hero. But in his private life, boy, he was kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. He was everything the opposite of what you saw on the screen. But at the end of his life, he got it together and he became a born-again Christian. Uh -huh. So that story appealed to me on, on several different levels. Well, before we jump into the book, The Jesus Music, let's briefly talk about your spiritual walk. I, I always love hearing people's testimonies, and I think it's encouraging to us as listeners to hear how, how different people found their faith and found a relationship with Jesus is important. So uh, let's just talk real briefly about how did you become a Christian? What what was that walk to, that journey to faith look like for you? Well, I hate to brag, but I have the greatest parents in the world. And well, we'll have they, to arm wrestle that one. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they have always been Christians, and I was raised in a Christian household. And so I got saved at the age of 12. And so there was never really anything radical in, in my life. There was never any rebellion. I loved my parents so much that, you know, I never, I, I always wanted to please them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, and, and, and they are the greatest Christian examples. I lost my dad last July to coronavirus. Sorry. And he was 83 years old. And so, um, and as a matter of fact, today I'm going to go take my mom. We're going to go to lunch and we're going to go see a play together. And oh. so, um, um, you know, we, we just have this, we have just, have always had a great relationship. My mom is, I don't think I've ever seen my mom sin. Like I said, I hate to brag. Yeah. She's just such a great, kind woman. My dad was the, the best, greatest example you could have of a dad. Um, he was in the military. He was in the Air Force. And so, um, you know, wherever we moved, wherever we went, the, the first priority was get the kids in school and let's find a good church. Yeah. So um, that's just kind of... Uh, uh, just a brief glimpse into my life. And then, and then, you know, um, I think I'm going to say five years ago, yeah, 2016, Greg Laurie approached me to do a book on, um, on Steve McQueen, you know, his, mm -hmm. his spiritual walk. Okay. And then we've been doing these spiritual biographies together. And so, um, you know, that's, that's renewed my faith quite a bit. Just, um, being around Greg, watching him, he's, he's such a good man and he's yeah. everything that, uh, that you think he is. He's just, yeah, he, he's, he, is, he is solid as a rock. Well, as we were preparing for this conversation, you wrote uh, in one of your emails that uh, the, the passing of your dad really hit home, that death is forever and that life with Christ is eternal. I love right. that statement. Would you care to expand on mm -hmm. that one just a little bit more? Sure. Well, I mean, I've had my dad my whole life. You know, I'm, I'm 58 years old and I, I'm lucky. And so, you know, it's, it's like the realization hits you. He is gone. I'm not going to see him on this earth ever again. Yeah. But thank goodness he was a Christian because 
you know, he, he has eternal life, but yeah, the, the, the opposite of that is like, wow, if he didn't, you know, if, if he didn't, um, you know, he might, he might have eternal life somewhere else and that would be really tough to swallow. And so it just start make it's just, you know, you start thinking of those things like, okay, I'm, I'm probably 20, 25 years out from where he is. Mm. Um, you know, and you hear that quite a bit about people who lose their parents. Yeah. It, it hits them, it jars them and it makes them think, and it makes them rededicate their, their faith. And I, I, I I've heard that. And then they, now I'm experiencing it. And so I, I know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, let's talk music. Well, let me, let me add one more thing. Yeah. I, I work in academia. So um, I have uh, access to some of the greatest minds in the world. And I interviewed a gentleman who is a librarian, but he's also a scholar. Mm -hmm. And he did a book on Jesus. I interviewed him about five years ago. And he did, he did this book where he was, he, he was able to access scrolls. Oh, wow. And, 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 and all this, all these incredible old religious artifacts. And I just asked him outright, did Jesus exist? And he looked at me like I was crazy. Hmm. And now this is a guy, I want to say he's an academic. I don't necessarily think he might've been a religious man, but he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, of course, of course uh, he lived. Of course, of course he is. Yeah. And, and that really hit home for me. Like, okay, so if he is real, like he says he is, you know, then the, then the Bible is real. Everything that, that comes out of the Bible is real. And, um, you know, that was just a strong thing that really hit me because, again, he looked at me like I was just crazy. Like, like did Jesus exist? He went, well, of course he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's those simple things that just really stick out and hit you in the face. Well, as you mentioned, you, you work in academia. And so you've written 26 books, and I'm assuming you're a professor then, right? No, no. no? I'm, a report, I'm a reporter. So okay. I, um, I write about uh, things that are happening on the campus. Okay. So um, okay. I have the military beat. I have the uh, I have a American uh, Indian Affairs beat, um, journalism. And then I have a thing called Q&A, which if there's breaking news, I'll go and I'll find an expert professor, and we'll talk about that. And we'll do a quick Q&A, two or three quick questions, and then hopefully that will generate some interest from the media, and they'll go to them and, and interview them more on the subject. Gotcha. I always, yep. love, I always love that joke. When news breaks, we fix it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, so the Jesus Music book, as we alluded to earlier, is not your first foray into books, and it's not your first foray into spiritual topics either. You've written about Johnny Cash, Elvis, Billy Graham. But something that I found interesting is that you're really not a fan of quote-unquote Christian music. You're, you're kind of a hard rock outside of the Christian music industry, if you will. Um, so I usually yes. think of a biographer or, a, or as somebody who's talking about something that they love and that they've dug into and the subject. So what drew you to writing this book since it's out of your quote unquote wheelhouse? <laughs> well, um, th this book came to me uh, through the Irwin brothers who directed the Jesus music movie. And uh, I worked with them on Steve McQueen and we're currently uh, working on a Johnny Cash documentary. Okay. Um, so I know those guys pretty well. And then this happened during the pandemic. They, what they did was they said, oh, they were pretty much shut down. So they, they're, they're headquartered out of Nashville. So they said, well, let's do something in Nashville with, with celebrities because they're just chomping at the bit to do something. So um, the, the producer, Joshua Walsh, came up with the idea, let's do a his history of contemporary Christian music. And then three-fourths of the thing, they, they knew that they had something very special. Mm -hmm. And um, so they said, well, let's, let's, maybe we'll get a companion book. Hey, who do we know? Hey, we know Marshall. Let's get him to write it. So they didn't care that I didn't know anything about contemporary Christian music. And I think the strength uh, that kind of comes from that um, is that you can, if you have an outsider that comes in and looks at something completely objective, yeah. you can have a totally different take on things. Um, in my case, if you read the book, I think I know you have, yep. there's a little bit of cynicism in there. Mm -hmm. There's a, I get a couple of laughs in there, um, but I think that those things were warranted. But on the other hand, um, if you can't tell, I have a great respect for uh, contemporary Christian music, the industry itself, because, you know, they started, you know, in a church basement. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're what, a $16 billion industry? <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't, who would not want to chronicle that? So that's what I did. I, I took not a business look at it, but kind of an artist and business look at it. The, the movie 
really focuses on the artist. But yeah. I wanted to focus on dollars and cents and artists and what made them tick. And I, I like the fact that uh, that you know the, the premise was they they sent me rough cuts by the way okay. of the movie, um, and so I, that's how I developed my story arc. And the final the final cut and the rough cuts are different. So the rough cuts did focus on the business and, and like stuff like the radio stations, um, but, the, but that didn't make it, end up making the final cut. So I developed my story, and I wanted my story just to be just a little bit different than the movie. I, I wanted to give readers something to, to really digest. I wanted to give them something different than the movie. I didn't want it to be, oh, you're just rereading the movie again. Right. I wanted to go into some little pockets and some little areas that I felt were interesting. And I thought maybe the reader would find that interesting as well. So that's kind of how that came about. Well, I'll admit I'm not a big reader. I mean, I used to read all voraciously, but as I've gotten, you know, work and job and stuff, um, but I, a lot of times I see movies as an adaptation of a book. I don't right, often see exactly. the other side of the other way around. So uh, was that a challenge to kind of try to follow kind of, like you said, this template that the Irwin brothers gave to you, but still make it something unique and different than, than what was on the movie so that it would be a standalone piece? It really wasn't a challenge because again, I, I've ha- I have that record industry knowledge. So I knew some things that perhaps that weren't in in the movie. Um, the funny thing was is that you know Joshua, as I was writing my chapters and, and they still weren't finished yet, and I was sending them to Joshua. He's like, "Oh man, you brought up something so good. We're going to put it in the movie." <laughs> so we were feeding off of each other, which was really cool. Makes a collaboration. Yeah, give us an example. I was kind of giving some context for the '60s. Yeah. You know how this evolved, and you know why people were disillusioned, and. Um, um, why certain like why the times make the men and women that they do yeah. you know it's that old saying do, do the people make the times or do the times make the people right and so um i think there was some of that in there um and then of course i went down to into some cubby holes like for example what's not in the movie but what's in the book is um john lennon's spiritual walk mm-hmm. and how by the end of the 70s a lot of rockers were getting burned out and john lennon was one of them and uh you know there was a period I won't say how long <laughs> that he became a born again Christian. Um, so I wanted to go down that and just tell people kind of like what I knew about that. And then there were also um, there there was also a segment on Bob Dylan where you know he he became a born again Christian for a good three years and recorded three albums um, that that people still talk about. So um, those were the little cubby holes and rabbit holes that I went into that perhaps the book you know the movie didn't. So. I'm just thinking, and and my writing is limited to the business world. I do financial stuff, which is not all that exciting. And I don't ever talk about it on the podcast because who wants to hear an accountant talk about numbers, right? But (laughs) as I've written, and especially in a topic as big as music or even as big as Christian music, there are a lot of stories that you could have gone down, quote unquote, the rabbit hole. How do you, how do you pick the ones that are interesting and how do you say, well, this is a rehash of something we've heard a million times and it doesn't really have something to include in the book? I just kind of go on by what I find interesting. You know, I, I always ask musicians, like, how, do you, how did you know that that was the right take? How did you know, mm-hmm. you know, like to put this little drum fill or this bongo fill on that track? And they always just go, I just by instinct. <laughs> so that's how I can answer it. You know, just, I go by what I find is interesting, but it still has to be, it still has to be relevant to the, to the book and the information, as long as it doesn't go way off course, mm-hmm. you know? And I always feel like the reader will, will go wherever you take them. Hmm. And the reader, and I always say the reader is very smart. And so they, uh, they'll pick up on whatever subtlety you throw their way. They're very smart. So, um, uh, that's, I guess that's the only way I can answer that. It's just kind of like my own gut instinct. So as you were, as you were researching this project, you had a lot of, like you said, footage given to you ahead of time from the, from the Irwin brothers. Were you able to do interviews one-on-one with artists as well? And, and what are some of the kind of the nuggets that you had from those? Well, they did, uh, two, I'm sorry. They did. Yeah. They, I think they did about. 200 interviews so there was really no need okay for me to interview anybody and they gave me they emailed me all the raw interviews as well so you know 
I, it, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip this over here so that you can see it. Can you see those papers? Oh, my goodness. That stack is about two and a half feet tall. That's right. Yeah. So that is, that is all the raw interviews that, that wow. they conducted. So there was no need for me to interview anybody because I had <laughs> these interviews. Um, with that said, there were two people that I interviewed for the book. And one was, one was from uh, the secular world and one was from the Christian world. And one, um, the first one was uh, Will Turpin, the basis for Collective Soul. Okay. Will's been a buddy of mine for many, many years. So as I was comparing and contrasting CCM and the rock world, yeah. I, I wanted, and I specifically talked to him about DC Talk and how, how can a group be so mega successful? And then you, you'd think that they'd want to keep their gravy train rolling. Yeah. Well, why, why would a group like, that's so successful like that break up? So he, you know, he explained it to me and he basically said, you know, once you become successful, that's when everybody is really tested and everybody has to know their own lane and everybody has to know their place. And if they don't, then there's going to be trouble because you are constantly with these people locked in a room in the studio, on the road, on the bus. And you have to be, you know, he, he said, Hey, look, there's always going to be fights. Um, but you just, you got to know how to get along because, you know, in, in my mind, I'm a money guy like you, like I'm going to keep that gravy train rolling as long as I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so why, why would I want to um, bust that up? But, you know, uh, in the case of DC talk, they, you know, at the end, you know, they, they just, they had to go their own way. Yeah. Um, so I had, I talked to him about that to get insight into that. Um, and then of course, uh, I also talked to him about, um, you know, when Napster came and, and yeah. just destroyed the industry, what were some of the uh, uh, things that you guys had to do? What were, you know, uh, to, 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 to make up for that uh, uh, mailbox money gap, you know? Mm -hmm. So he told, he told me about um, things like, well, yeah, we had to do uh, take gigs that we normally don't get, but pay the same amount, um, you know, like wineries and, um, and sporting events, you know, um, those sorts of things. So, and then the VIP meet and greets, you know, that was another yeah. way that they, they had to make money, but they, but now they had to spend 60 to 70% of their time on the road. Oh, yeah. And people today don't necessarily want to hear any new material. They just want to hear the greatest hits, which Isn't just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, they're constantly on the tour, just playing their greatest hits or a variation of it. But collective souls great in that, oh, um, love they continue. Soul. They're amazing. Aren't yeah. they? Oh, I man. really, I, and I've told these guys this and that they just, they get red in the face every time I tell them or they're, they're just so, um, uh, I, I said, you know, there's no group that I know of other than the Beatles that do melody and arrangements like you guys do. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, you can't compare us to the Beatles. There's no way we're not like them. Like, yeah, but you guys are really good. Yeah. You don't even know it. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to be able to tell, uh, the guys that you admire, how good they are. Yeah. Uh, how did you get connected with Will? Uh, you know, um, I was writing for a uh, uh, magazine at the time, and um, it was their third album. And so we just connected. And then, you know, throughout the years, we just connected. And then finally, I started writing press releases for him oh, wow. and pr prom promoting him when he, when he became a solo act. So then we just stayed in touch uh, ever since then. Those guys are just good down-home guys. Yeah, they're, they they're really... Um, and then, but to answer your other question, so the other person that um, I interviewed was John um, John Schlitt of Petra. Okay, because I just wanted I wanted a great guy, great singer. Yeah, um, and I knew him through Will's friend Jason Fowler, who was oh, a Christian sure. artist. Yeah, and you they, know who Jason is? Absolutely. They, both of those guys have been on the podcast. So yeah, really. Oh, yeah. I love Jay. Jason's a brother. Yeah. So um, so uh, Jason is in a, a group with. Uh, Witchlet uh, Union of the uh, Saints and Sinners. Yep. And so I said, Hey, give me Schlitt's number. I want to call him <laughs> <laughs> because we were writing about Petra. Yeah. And um, they, they were, so in, in, in the movie, they were, they were talking about Petra. And I said, I want to interview with somebody that was in Petra. So I talked to, and I met John briefly before at, at one of his shows because I went to go see Jason. So, um, um, he was fantastic. I mean, he gave me some great stuff. He talked about how Petra, um, how they picketed them, you yeah. know, when they were at the height of their success, they were, yeah. they were selling out like 20,000 people 
and like 10,000 would come for an altar call yeah. and, and still these radical churches would uh, berate them and, and say they were uh, playing the devil's music. And yeah. um, so we asked him how he dealt with that. Um, so it, it gave a great little, you know, nice touch again, something different than what the movie was giving you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, as you were telling about both of these interviews, I had a couple of stories that, that I wanted to jump in with. And one was, I was uh, fortunate enough to perform or to promote as a concert promoter, DC talk on the Jesus freak tour, uh, wow. the Pacific Northwest. And I did three shows with them. But my favorite story was uh, we were up in Tacoma at the Tacoma Dome in Tacoma, Washington. And after the show, it was the final four weekend. And so we were all on the DC Talk bus kind of watching the game. And you'll see these three guys who are just tearing each other apart on the bus. <laughs> and it's, and it's well, when you stood there, you were in the way when I tried to do this. And, and it was all in the, in the guise of creativity. And I just sat back and watched it as... This is a bunch of really creative people being truly honest about the work that they're doing, trying to hone and make their their stuff better. And I, I I did not see at the time, I was probably just oblivious to it, that there was this tension of these three creatives that were starting to go apart. And as far as I'm concerned, everything they did after Jesus Freak just was not nearly as interesting because there was that kind of, we all want to, you know, the, the popularity of me rather than the popularity of the group and the tension of that. And, and you kind of touched on that. The movie kind of touched on that too, of how celebrity often gets in the way of the ministry aspect of things. Talk a little bit about that piece as you developed the book. Well, um, you know, it was the critic, John Still, um, and I don't remember if it's in the movie or not, but what he was basically saying was, when when Christian artists become celebrities, then that becomes really kind of dangerous because um, they're now, um, you know, they're now being fawned over and now they're being treated like somebody else. You know, they, they've got the photo shoots, they've got the videos. Uh, it now becomes what we say in the book, a Jets and limousine world. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. um, it's hard for them, I've got to believe, to... Uh, to maintain that um, that um, that normalcy, so um, you know you've got fans asking for your autograph. So I mean, every the whole dynamic changes. I think so. Um, and at the end, and at the end of one of the chapters, we say, "And fame leads to temptation." Yeah. And then there's a whole chapter, what we call "Fallen Angels," yeah. where they all fell into some sort of uh, temptation, and um, you know, in some cases, they were banned for a couple of years. Yeah. Which which brings up another interesting topic that I want to get into, and that is, as we as attenders go to church, or as we bring new people into church, we have this, come as you are, we accept the sinner and the saint, but when that saint becomes somebody that we look up to, and they fall, then we have problems. What, what do you think it is about our church today that says, or even the church in the 90s when some of this stuff was happening, that says, okay, once you become a believer, you have no room to have falls and have make mistakes. When I think Bill Gaither said it in the interview, if you want me to put together a room full of Christian singers that have never failed, it's going to be an empty room. He said something like that. Talk a yeah. little bit about your impression of that as you did this book. Well, that was the one thing that made me want to do the book. Was hmm. uh, the, uh, I, think, I think John and Andy were basically saying that the uh, a Christian artist can be messy, and so I w that's the thing that I wanted to explore. That's the that was the hook that made me want to do the book because I thought, oh yeah, they're right. <laughs> it's so simple, but you just you, you just never think of, oh, Christians can be messy too. Okay, oh, that's an interesting concept. I'm not sure anybody's ever written about that before in in such a way. And so, um, again, yeah, that was. You know, that was, you know, me being the cynical journalist, I wanted to explore that. And of course, um, when some of this stuff was happening, we're going to go back into the 80s with Andre Crouch. Oh, and, sure. uh, and then um, and then um, what happened to Sandy Patty and Amy Grant in the 90s? It was just, uh, you know, it was terrible because, um, yeah, I, they, they fell from grace. But boy, the way they got treated is, is equivalent to. The cancel culture that we're seeing today. I mean, um, their their records stopped playing. 
uh, record stores cop, stop carrying their product. Um, you know, it's it's one thing, it's one thing to call them out, but it's another thing to stop someone's living. Yeah. You know, that's where it kind of that's where. Well, I don't draw the line anywhere because I'm, I'm not going to judge anybody. But I, I think when people when the, when when it stops somebody's living, that's when you got to go. Okay, this is a little crazy. But you you have to remember that CCM was still early in its formation, and that the church elders were probably a lot older. Not as um, I think the Christian lived experience now, people people have lived in the, in the, in, the, in the, you know they're they're making decisions uh on on becoming a christian because they've lived and they know what's good they know what's bad perhaps in the older days just kind of like me i was i was just raised that way so i i think what there was a dynamic that was going on where you had the elder church uh um people in the church that were making these decisions and um basically saying let's ban these folks whereas now i don't think I'm not so sure that would happen. I would think that they'd say, "Hey, let's get you some counseling. Let's get you some help. Let's um, let's just take you off the radar for a little while." You know? Yeah. I think that's that's the course that would be happening today. Um, and and back then it was kind of extreme because it was it was new. Well, the other thing that we were, as you were talking about interviewing these folks, talking about um, you know, the the folks that were picketing Petra. Uh, I I interviewed a guy named Dallas Holm. I don't know if you're familiar with who Dallas is. Dallas was way, uh, in Youth for Christ in the early, early days, and he was a folk singer, uh, but was trying to make music for kids, the kids of the generation. And he would go to a church, and, and the pastor would kick him off the stage because he had electricity in his guitar. And our podcast <laughs> listeners remember that interview with Dallas where he would talk about he'd go up and he'd set up and he'd per- get ready, and the pastor would come in wide-eyed, you've got an electric guitar, what the heck, that's not Christian. You know, how how does electricity make that guitar any better or worse, you know? But again, it was that whole piece of the church trying to catch up with culture. Right. And I see the scripture all the time that says, be in the world, not of the world. But being in the world means keeping your finger on the pulse of culture. Right. So how do you see the movement of our music from the Jesus music now into this juggernaut that we talked about, what was it, $16 billion? How do you see, was the church playing catch up that whole time? Or do you think the church was driving that? Or do you think there was a little bit of both? Well, I think the church was probably playing catch up. Again, remember, this all starts with the hippie movement. Mm -hmm. And so you you start from an extreme point of view. I mean, uh, if you recall in writing about uh, Calvary Chapel, it was... um, it was a conservative church and all of a sudden all these hippies come in in droves and they're wearing <laughs> some of them, you know, they're, they're reeking of patchouli. They, um, they're wearing Indian feathers. They're coming in barefoot. They're sticking their toes in the communion cup holders. <laughs> um, and then of course they, then they, they bring in their own radical music. Yeah. So, uh, so from that point on, um, you know, the church elders and what I call the religious intelligentsia yeah. had been playing catch up. Cause they didn't know how to deal with that. And then, and then of course the elders pass away and the new elders come in mm-hmm. and it's kind of like what I remember about Keith Richards um, saying, you know, for, for years uh, the stones were the enemy of the cops. And then all of a sudden, like in 1981, um, you know, a young cop comes up to him and asks him for his autograph and he's like, Oh, okay. We're accepted <laughs> now. It's the same concept. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my favorite part of that story uh, about the early church. So we we who've been in the music circles for a long, the Christian music circles for a long time, know of Calvary Chapel as kind of the mecca of Christian music, right? But right. my favorite part of that story is it wasn't Chuck Smith that said, yeah, this is something that we should do. It was his wife that said, okay, Chuck, now come on, we're going to go down to where the hippies are. In fact, we're going to invite a hippie <laughs> into our home. <laughs> and I heard you talk on another interview that that Lonnie Frisbee yes. was, was one of the characters that you especially latched on to. Oh, absolutely. This was this hippie guy that Chuck and his wife invited into their home to live with them for several weeks to learn the hippie culture. So talk a little <laughs> bit about Lonnie and your, your fascination with him. In, in, the, in the book, it, it's, it's easy to make fun of the hippies, um, but Lonnie was like this super hippie. I mean, this is a guy that came from the San Francisco scene. Like he was into the occult for a little while. Uh, then he became a Christian. 
and then he worked at a uh, place called the Living Room that served, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was serving other hippies and, and, and other down and outers. And he had an encounter with Charles Manson, and uh, he said Manson would come in and say he was God and the devil, and then make fun of those people. But he, but Lonnie said, but he'd always eat our delicious soup. <laughs> <laughs> And then from there, um, he'd, hitchh- he'd hitchhike from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And the only reason why he did that was to preach to, to, to people in the cars. Uh-huh. And um, so when, um, when uh, Chuck Smith's wife said, she declared, we have to meet a hippie. <laughs> and so um, her, the, 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 uh, her daughter was dating this gentleman who introduced them to Lonnie, who was the super hippie. Yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, the, the Greg Laurie wrote in another book, that's when nitro met glycerin. Interesting. And because, because, because Chuck was a world war two vet, completely conservative. And so here he is not only invite him to his home, but invites him to live yeah. in his home. And so Lonnie goes, Hey, I just got married. Do you mind if I hitchhike up to San Francisco and bring my wife down to come live with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck says, yes. And so all of a sudden, Lonnie starts preaching and all these hippies start coming to this church. And again, it almost sounds like this, uh, this sounds like a comedy skit, but it's not. And, and the other thing too, is again, the, the, the hippies were, um, they're very, very uh, honest in their faith. So these hippies were coming in droves to the church and they had to expand the church and have like three services. And, but Lonnie was the guy that uh, love song came up to and said, uh, Hey man, we'd love to play our kind of music in your church. Yeah. And so they had to go get permission from Chuck Smith. <laughs> but the funny thing was, is that uh, the, the great story about that one is, is um, they said, uh, so Chuck finally invites him. He goes, uh, and they go, yeah, man, but there's one hitch. Uh, one of our band members is in jail on a pot possession. <laughs> <laughs> so I write through the grace of God and a, and a talented bell bondsman. They got him out. He, they play that night, and the and the place goes nuts. They, it explodes, and that was the birth of uh, the Jesus music. Can you imagine what that interaction was that first night with Lonnie sitting there with Chuck and saying, "I got to go bring up my wife," and I can just picture Chuck going, "No way," and 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 Chuck's wife sitting across, kind of giving him that look. You will say yes. I can just picture that in my mind. Well, and the other thing was, we discovered that there was about. 30, 35 hippies living in their house. They had like a two or three bedroom home and they had bunk beds in every room, bunk beds in the garage. One guy was sleeping in the bathtub and and they were baptizing, they were baptizing people in, in the pool. And then, and then Chuck was like in two or three days later, he was saying, now go out, go out and, 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 and recruit other people. And one of those, then one of those people was, uh, was Greg Laurie. That's what he did. Yeah. You know, he, he went out into a pirate's cove and started, rec- you know, uh, preaching. And that's how, that's how Greg Laurie got his start. It's quite an amazing story. I mean, I, so, will something like that happen again? I, I don't know. I, I, I hope so. But those stories are just too great. You know? Yeah. Well, one of the people that I've always looked up to is Glenn Kaiser and you, he was interviewed in the film. And so you saw his transcripts and we had him on the podcast a few weeks ago, but he said something to the effect of as, as a hippie, he was all into whatever he was doing, whether it was drugs, whether it was sex, whatever it was. And that when he became a Christian, he treated that the same way he treated everything else. He was all in. Mm-hmm. And I see a lot of the people in that hippie movement were that way. It was, I'm all in to what I'm discovering. And I think, quite frankly, that's why the music thing blew up so much is because they were all into their music, their peace and love stuff. And all of a sudden that jives with this spiritual piece and that blows up and and uh, yeah, pretty incredible. Yeah and, yeah, and guys like him are now the church elders. Yeah, so they're they're a little bit cooler, you know. They're they're, they're cooler than the than the church elder of of yesteryear. They're more understanding, and they've lived life, and um, and they probably you know ha- have a much better understanding of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I those are the people I connect with the most. Well, give us one more character that I call him character intentionally <laughs> that you discovered in your book that in writing this book that you went, oh my gosh, this is an interesting individual that I just am drawn <laughs> to. <laughs> well, the look on your face, you know who I'm going to say, and that's <laughs> that's Larry Norman. When I when I heard, I, you know, as a journalist, you're always looking for 
interesting, complex people. Mm -hmm. Um, Steve McQueen was one of those. John Lennon was one of those. Mm. And Larry Norman reminded me a lot of those two. Um, so uh, he, he was dichotomous and complex. Yeah. Um, and I write in the book that, uh, you know, he was, I think he, he was raised, uh, he, he attended like an African-American Pentecostal church in his youth, headed up a flower power band, uh, had a hit single, um, and then wrote for Capitol Records, which was, you know, the, the premier label um, of its time. Because it, it had the beach, the Beatles and the Beach Boys. Yeah. Um, and so he was uh, he was writing uh, rock operas during the day, and then he was going out at night and preaching to people, uh, prostitutes and transvestites and all kinds of street people, and um, talking about Jesus. But then when when he um, when he cut that that first album, and kind of became this figurehead for uh, a Christian rock. Um, he boy, he had a hard nose for business, and so you know, it's sad it is to say he, um, you know, he he recruited he he got his own record label. So he recruited people, stole their publishing, and then in one case, in the case of Randy uh, Stonehill, yeah. he not only took his his publishing, but then he he married his 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 first wife. So you know, um, a lot of people might one one person I, I I saw a documentary on him, and the quote about Larry Norman was. Um, yeah, he was a Christian, but only on the stage. Mm. And uh, that was a pretty rough assessment of him. But, um, you know, there are just people in life that just pinball between the two extremes. And so those are the, those are the most interesting people to write about. And so I found him extremely interesting. Um, so, that, yeah, so he and Lonnie Frisbee are, I think, what I call my two favorite characters in the book. Yeah, Chuck Smith, Chuck Smith too, for, for the opposite reason, that he was – Extremely conservative, a no nonsense guy, and yet was willing to be open uh, to another way. And so I respect that a lot too. Yeah, Larry Norman is fun for me. I I got to promote one of his last concerts. Um, in fact, we had to have a medic on standby because that was after Larry had all of his heart issues. And just a couple of years later, he passed away. But he's actually buried where I live. He's buried here in Salem, Oregon. And uh, so that's kind of a fun tie into the history. But Working with him was, he was much mellower towards the end of his years. But like you said, there was a different person on stage than there was off stage, which makes me wonder how many of us as individuals have our Sunday morning face and our daily face that we, you know, during the work week, during the time with our home. And how are the musicians any different than we are? They really aren't. They're just people that have a different talent. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. You're spot on, but you know, they're in the public spotlight, so they have to be, you know, they're, 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 they're looked upon as they must be this way at all times and um, not allowed to have human moments. So that's a great point. Which if we talk, and I use this example all the time, but we don't hold our plumbers to the same standard. <laughs> Why is it that we hold our ministers and our, and our singers to the same standard? Now there should be something, if you're teaching, you should know, be the expert at that. But at the same time, you know, we need to be a little bit more free with grace and forgiveness, I think. And I think that's kind of what you were pointing at when you were talking about the Sandy Patty and the Amy Grant situation and some of those kinds of things. Absolutely. So, well, as someone who's researched Christian music like you have from kind of its fine beginnings to this business behemoth, what was your kind of takeaway over where the health of the music industry is at this point? Well, here's what I, th I think happened. Um, you know, rock and roll was created in the 50s, um, you know, through the Big Bang of uh, Elvis, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Carl Perkins, all those guys. Um, and then rock and roll had its peak in 1972 with, uh, they did $8 billion dollars uh, in, in money. And now if you can imagine that was bigger than the movie industry wow. in, in terms of money. Yeah. yeah. And that was the 1972 was the year that the Godfather came out deliverance. Um, some pretty big movies cabaret. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you can, so you can imagine. So, uh, and, and more people attended rock concerts than they did sporting events. That's another. Wow. Mind blower. Yeah. So um, 1972 is also the year that Explo 72 occurs. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at things, um, CCM has always been sort of 20 years behind um, 
the music, the, the secular music industry. But by the 90s, that all changes and they catch up. Yeah. And so CCM is regularly crossing over into regular radio. Uh, artists like Amy Grant are selling just as much. Uh, yeah, there, there, was a, there was a comment uh, that she sold out the LA Forum. And that the, the only artist who did that in their peak, in their heyday, was the Eagles, Paul McCartney, Led Zeppelin. I mean, those those were the kind of uh, Alice Cooper, Three Dog Night, um, and they always used the LA Forum as an excuse to do like their last stop, and mm. that, that's so Amy Grant, you know, sells that place out with no problem. <laughs> so CCM has finally caught up, and then of course we have Napster right at the yep. m- millennium, and it levels both industries right to the ground. Yeah. So then. Um, as the movie rightly points out, uh, then then you have the rise of worship music, mm. and so now I think um, I, I think I've read where Spotify and Pandora and all these streaming services have kind of brought music back in terms of money to where it once was, and so now we have these stars like Toby Mac and Lecrae, Lauren Daigle. Who we know are, are Christian stars, but you know they don't necessarily feel the need that they have to label themselves. Mm-hmm. So um, again, I think we're now the CCM is, is almost same as same equal footing because Toby Mac is coming here to Phoenix, and I was kind of curious, like what kind of venue would he play? Sure. Well, turns out he's going to play the Glendale Arena, which holds twenty thousand people, and I just went, "Wow!" I I just I had no clue. Yeah, I was really shocked, and again. Those are the kinds of venues that uh, Miley Cyrus would play and sell out or, or um, Taylor Swift. So, again, the way I look at it, it seems now like it's back on equal footing again. So, based on what you've researched and based on kind of your gut feeling, what is your hope for the future of music in the Christian realm? I'm not calling it Christian music per se, but music in right. the Christian realm. Well, um, I, 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 the, the hope is is that uh, they will continue on in the tradition of the pioneers, and that is that uh, um, they'll continue writing music about their faith. Um, I, I, I think it's a good thing that they don't necessarily have to declare themselves because you know it, 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 any Christian wants to try and reach the unbeliever. So um, I, I think that's that's probably the, the future of it. I think the future here is is kind of kind of now. I mean, we're just now they've just blended to where, okay, this is how I believe. This is how I feel. Um, and, uh, I could be an artist just as big as, uh, uh, uh anyone in the secular world. And that, that's kind of where we are. I mean, uh, those guys like for King and country, mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> look how big those guys are. They're now doing duets with Dolly Parton yeah. and, um, uh, the, their videos are just as artistic and as big as, as anyone else. So, I mean, it, it just seems like we're just kind of there, the future. I think the only difference now is just the sound that it's going to be, you know, uh, we, no one can ever predict the sound or the trend, but in terms of just uh, industry, it's there already. So Marshall, what's next for you? You've got this book, you're, you're, this is just coming out and we're getting ready to probably do some publicity tour stuff with that, but what's your next project? What's, what's next on your horizon as far as something you're writing? Well, I'm going to be, uh, I've got a book coming out with Greg Laurie. It's called Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. And we're mm-hmm. going to explore the, the, the lives of rock stars. And um, so we're going to talk, we're going to start from rock and roll's beginning in the 50s and take it all the way to now and how it's kind of the same thing that we're just talking about. Um, I'm also going to be doing a uh, biography of Jay Sebring. Jay Sebring was um, the celebrity hairstylist who was killed in the Manson murder. Oh, okay. And um, so I'm doing this with his family. The family has always said, Jay, there's two Jay Sebrings. There was the guy before he was killed and the guy after. And the guy that was, that, 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 that before he was killed, he was the first guy that brought men's uh, hairstyling to, to the United States and, okay. and the world. Because before you, you just had the buzz cut, right? Then he got into the uh, movie world. And he was the guy that, that introduced Bruce Lee to the um, producer of the green Hornet. And he, he cut Jim Morrison's hair. He's cut Steve McQueen's hair, Paul Newman. He really helped shape the look of the sixties. And then of course this tragedy happens um, with the Manson family. And then all of a sudden people are writing terrible things about this guy. He's getting maligned and, and Manson's getting all this attention and, 
uh, people were wearing Manson t-shirts and you know, nobody really seems to care about the, the victims. So that's kind of what we're going to focus on with that book. Well, so it sounds like uh, you probably have 27, 28, 29, and maybe 30, uh, your 30th book lined <laughs> up already. <laughs> well, and, and book, uh, books, uh, book projects kind of come quickly and swiftly. So like you, you just, um, it's kind of like a, a, you know, a movie script. Like it comes and you've got to decide if you're going to take it or not. There's another uh, perhaps an Elvis project that might be coming my way too. So we, we don't know. It just all depends on time and um, if it'll happen or not. So, uh, but I'm always looking for, for projects to do. So very cool. But, but I want to say that Jesus music was the funnest project I've ever done. Cause it, I had a lot of laughs writing it. I mean, it was, again, we, we talked about that hippie segment and yeah. uh, that was fun. Um, it was just, uh, I, I just found it so interesting because I knew nothing about it. And, um, uh, there was definitely a story arc to it. There's yeah. definitely a storyline to it. And uh, hopefully in the next 50 years, there'll be uh, more stories. Every Saturday, we send out a prayer newsletter asking folks to pray for the people who are in the music industry and, and doing stuff. What can we be praying specifically for you in the weeks and the months coming up ahead? Wow, that's a great question. Um, well, I would just ask people to pray for um, my health. I am healthy, but uh, you know, as you know, my dad died of coronavirus, and actually, I got COVID, and I just got my booster last night. So mm -hmm. I'm just—I uh, want to continue for people to pray for my my good health, and that uh, I don't get it again, and that uh, everybody um, is safe, and uh, you know, they don't get it because it's it's a terrible, ter terrible thing. You know, losing my dad, to COVID was just. It just, it's, I'm still kind of in shock. You know, it's, it's been over a year. It's, it's been tough and it's really been tough on my mother. So uh, maybe a prayer for my mother that uh, her heart is uh, lightened and uh, can continue, you know, to go forward with her life. One of the things I appreciate about the Jesus Music book is that it paints a picture of how the people who create the music we love are just normal people. Sure, they have gifts of writing music or capturing feelings in song, but the bottom line is that they are regular folks, just like you and me, using their abilities to point people to Jesus. Why is that important for us to remember? Well, there isn't one of us who should be set apart as someone to idolize or be put on a pedestal. We're all the same at the foot of the cross, sinners who have received the gift of forgiveness. Sometimes we do great things for the Lord, and sometimes we fail miserably. But at the end of the day, Jesus died for us and wants each of us to have a personal relationship with him. And ultimately, God wants us to use the gifts and skills we have that he's given us to share God's love with others. One of my desires with this podcast is to showcase how normal people, following God's leading, can make a positive impact on the world. That may be singing from a stage like the musicians we enjoy, or it might be a mother caring for her children. It might be as an active participant in your church, or maybe as a business person running a company ethically. God can use us in whatever space we are in and whatever messes we get into. We just need to be faithful to follow God's will and direction. I really like Romans 12 verses 6 through 8 that says this, in His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. I'd like to encourage you this week to use your gift well. And don't let your past mistakes or failures get in the way of serving God well and serving God gladly. Marshall has a lot of stories to share about the history of CCM, and I strongly recommend that you pick up his book, The Jesus Music. You can find that book anywhere you buy books, and I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to pick up a copy easily. As always, thanks for joining me for this conversation today. I am grateful that we get to spend this time together each week hearing stories of God's amazing faithfulness. 
As a regular listener to this podcast, would you mind taking a few minutes and rating it on your favorite podcast app? Reviews and ratings really help spread the word so that other folks can hear about these great conversations. And if you have comments or questions for me, please feel free to drop me a message on any of the social media platforms. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon by searching for at CCM Exchange. Or you can always drop me an email on the website christianmusicarchive.com. I'm really looking forward to our time together next week when I have another great conversation with one of the musicians you'll find on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. So until then, remember this, God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you.